Evening, folks, and uh, evening, sovereigns, and welcome to another uh, Donegal show. Uh, good to have you all here. And tonight, I've got a, a fellow host, MSI host on, and uh, someone that I've, I've got to know over the last uh, few weeks. We had a few uh, Skype conversations. Uh, I've got Freeman Jack. And tonight, folks, we are going to take you on a journey <laughs> through <laughs> space and time. And uh, we're going to try and make sense of it. And we're going to try and uh, smash some of the paragrams that are out there, some of the, the, the superstitions. And uh, we're going to see what this reality is really made of. And uh, we're going to start off nice and slow. We're going to build up to a crescendo. And uh, I'll be looking for questions out of the, the chat box because um, this transcends everything. This transcends all our petty squabbles and all our races and all our religions. No, this is this is this is actually what reality is. It's the uh, the essence. And, the essence uh, of transcendence. Yes, indeed. Transcendence, indeed. So, without further ado, I'll uh, introduce you to Freeman Jack. And uh, we'll start our show. Jack, you're very welcome to the Donegal Show. Good evening, Donegal, and it's really good to be back on MSI again. I'm terribly sorry to, to uh, the listeners who are expecting me to uh, return to my uh, to a, uh, the midnight slot on Thursday last week, but unfortunately I fell asleep. Yeah. <laughs> it can happen. It can happen. Are you going to come back on as a regular again? Yeah, because I, 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 I must... I have been put back on the slot. I've, I've not. I'm not going to uh, evict um, Nick from my old nine till twelve. I'm actually a bit, a bit more of a night owl myself, anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm going to take the old um, uh, midnight on slot, yeah. um, which also gives me a little uh, leeway as well to perhaps explore uh, some subjects in greater or lesser depth, rather than being constricted to a three-hour show weekly. Yeah. I noticed uh, which, that about you too. Uh, when I was in Korea, uh, like the eight-hour typing difference, everyone else was in bed. Uh, you were up, <laughs> like you were, you were on the Skype, and you were furiously typing. And <laughs> I got some good advice from you. You, know? you, you caught you you caught me on a on a on a, a blazing high at that particular time. I, 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 I tend to I tend to go through sort of biorhythmical phases, intellectual yeah. phases, where sometimes it's just all hooked up and and jumping, and sometimes it's a bit dim and dismal. Yeah. Excited. And, and uh, yeah, I definitely, uh, I definitely felt the vibe. Those, uh, uh, those uh, exchanges were very uh, bright and uh, informative. Yeah, I enjoyed them. I, re- I really, I got a lot out of them. Um, on a personal level, I got an awful lot out of it as well. You know. Well, that's the point, really. Here of of sort of coming on air with you tonight was that that po- that personal level is is very was is is probably as important to me as it is to you. In as much as uh, I think that some of the the gain that you got from our discussions was a rational view of something that you had held as a superstitious belief about something that had actually happened to you. Yes. And that in the the logical explanation of consensus and non-ordinary reality, we begin to have at least, I mean, again, please please don't anybody assume that the the models that I give are in any way an accurate description of reality. They simply are a more accurate model with which to describe the human experience. Yes. And as such, they're, they're just a tool. They're yeah? open to interpretation. They're open to interpretation to a certain degree, and, yeah. and to some degree we all need to construct our own models of our own reality. So it, they are, the, you know, I mean, they're the, the Lego bricks with which people can then go on to explain their own existence to their own satisfaction. And that's really what's driven me to this point, yeah. was that I, through my, uh, through my epilepsy, through my temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, and through my pursuit of hardcore psychedelic drug consumption in my teens, 20s and 30s, and pretty much to this present date, really, I, I have calmed down distinctly. Yeah. Um, but uh, the combination of those two has launched me into realms that most people never experience. Yes. They're probably the realms that are normally um, restricted to, you know, what I mean, the the miracles of saints, <laughs> as they're described yeah. in the yeah. Bible. You know, what I mean, they're the sort of burning bush um, experiences, sort of thing. Uh, booming voices from out of nowhere uh, issuing you with books with strange symbols written on them that will shift and wriggle when you try and look at them. Yes. Um, 
which is actually funny enough the most peculiar experience because i had never understood that particular um experience until that piece that i wrote and sent to you uh donny yeah um about the 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 numerical uh main frame yes and i realized that the the numerical symbols that i was seeing on that on the pages of that book in that particular experience were very likely the symbols that you would need to describe this three-dimensional mathematics. Right. Well, okay. Okay. Now you say that this is only, um, open to interpretation, your model, but your model is getting, uh, it's actually getting a lot of attention from the scientific, uh, community. A lot of people in the, that, that community are, uh, identifying, uh, and proven, uh, things that you have said to me. So, Let's take it down to its core and let's and explain to people what your uh, version and what your model of reality is. And, and okay, if, yeah. okay. Well, I suppose the simplest description would be uh, digital virtual reality. Now, most people think of that as sort of holographic images on a computer, but in this sense, I'm using the words in their most literal sense. Digital in the respect that uh, reality would appear not to be analog. It would appear to be in packet form. It arrives in discrete chunks. Uh, this can be discovered right down to the subatomic level. Um, uh, photons are packets of light. They're digital. Yeah? Light isn't analog. It's digital. Yes. It arrives in packets in chunks. So that's what I mean by digital. Virtual, well, quite simply virtual, uh, not real, not substantial, okay, insubstantial. So we have a, a reality that is constructed of packets of data. It's insubstantial. And obviously reality is our experience of our own existence. Yeah? Yeah. Now, in that description of reality, we have two distinct halves of reality. We have something that I used the term consensus reality to describe. And I tend to resort to a term I think was actually plagiarized by Carlos Castaneda, and that's non-ordinary reality. Uh, to describe everything else. So essentially with consensus reality, we have this uh, reality that we construct uh, as a, communally, as a group. The streets that we all walk down, the, the houses that we all live in, are constructed out of a consensus belief in the existence of those objects. Okay. Uh, now, now, when we step outside of consensus reality, we can do that quite simply. Uh, I, I'll give the example of the skydiver. Now, for the skydiver, I can only imagine the experience, the reality that a skydiver experiences hurling himself out of a plane. Yeah? Yeah. So that falls outside of my consensus reality. I have to, I have to receive that as, as uh, given information, as somebody else's experience. For those skydivers, their consensus reality is only in consensus with the, the other group of skydivers. Okay, yeah, so although yeah. we, we still have a, a separate consensus reality, but this is now consensus reality that only has a very minor overlap with the general consensus reality. Yeah. So you can see how reality has all of these various subsets where various people's specific experience defines them into a selective consensus reality group. Now, it would appear that under extreme circumstances... Uh, there would appear to be some sort of a time code. If you've ever dealt in raw video back in the old days, uh, we used to have time code uh, as a as a little digital signal that would run on the bottom of the frame. You wouldn't be able to see it on a normal TV screen, but the, yes, yes. the professional equipment would pull it up and you'd see the time code scrolling on the bottom of the screen. Well, essentially, it would appear that for uh, reality to be consecutive and linear, it appears to have what if what is effectively a time code written underneath it so it knows where it is or certainly so you know where you are on it and under certain extraordinary circumstances certainly temporal lobe, lobe epilepsy uh, certain extremes of psychedelic abuse uh, certain extremes of um, uh, uh, sedative abuse essentially switch off the senses so much that eventually you lose the time signature. At this point, you're now into non-ordinary reality. You're no longer in the shared reality that everybody else exists in. Yes. This non-ordinary reality is still constructed exactly the same as consensus reality. So your experience of it is of, of 
being it being ordinary. The only thing that's non-ordinary about it is some of the things that happen there. Now, uh, this possibly explains the, the sort of uh, mysticism and the superstitions about sort of devils and demons and angels and fairies, and because these are all. Uh, I hate to re- re- revert to jargon here, but these are archetypes. These are archetypal characters. Uh, the reason why the grim fairy tales were written about those characters was because those were the the cultural characters of mythology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were the, the stories that their grandmothers had told them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these these creatures exist in the cultural subconscious, and when we're extracted from consensus reality, we enter into a world of our own creation. So largely, it looks like ordinary reality, but it. it can- and sometimes be occupied by these creatures that are simply summoned up from our own archetypal uh, impressions. So if the if the, the sensation of non-ordinary reality suddenly starts to feel rather strange, you suddenly start to realise, well, this isn't where I was a minute ago. What's going on here? And once that strangeness sets in, you start to get the paranoia, the looking over your shoulder sort of sensation, which is where the demons and the and the elves and the all jump in from the subconscious to occupy that that justification for fear. Okay, so so what you're saying is that conscious reality is, uh, is based on the reality in which a group of people or um, a culture of people believe to be reality, real, the, our day-to-day mm-hmm. living. Mm-hmm. And what you're saying is that when we take a psychedelic, or in your case, a psychedelic, or or uh, you, you go into your epilepsy, that that time frame uh, is altered. You're in you're in actually another reality that is real to you, but the, the the time frame has stopped, and that you can conjure up um, these archetypes that young young covered it uh, from your subconscious, and they come into this reality. They come into the non-ordinary reality. The non-ordinary yes. reality, yes. I mean, uh, bearing in mind that non-ordinary reality experiences have also been shared by... Uh, it's. Uh, I've had uh, four reports now of people on um, on acid trips who have swapped bodies and have spent the entire trip in the other person's body experiencing the other person's brain, which is also something that led me to some fairly stark conclusions about what the brain actually is. And it isn't the mind. No, it's it's, uh, yeah. it's the oh, hardware that the mind expresses itself through into the body. And again, it's the whole the whole issue of digital virtual reality is not only am I suggesting that this world around us is virtual, but we're virtual as well. Yes. <laughs> but when I when I when I fall, free, uh, Jack, when I fall and I and I hurt my knee and I, or I hurt my elbow, it hurts. When you get shot in uh, code of conduct or whatever it is these bloody teenagers are all shooting at each other do you fall down dead on the floor or do you have to respawn yeah well that's uh, exactly it's essentially i mean tom campbell explains it beautifully he uses the world of warcraft and uh the sims uh computer games as an example essentially those games both have a rule set if you're walking around in the sims hologram in the Sims virtual reality, your Sim character cannot walk through other other characters. It can't through, walk through walls. Yeah, when you yeah. when you switch the computer off and you come back to the game, it's in the same state or progressively in a linear phase to some future state. It's not at some random place where you've never seen before. Yes. So this is essentially the 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 reality. There are rules to our reality. And the, the the reality that we experience is essentially a numerical mathematical algorithm, and yes. it is a self evolving algorithm. And as such, uh, the 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 uh, the the aim of it would appear to achieve greater complexity, and the observed actions of it would be those of of a uh, uh, a mechanism, let's say, an autonomous mechanism, uh, which has built into its very uh, rule set uh, the 
preferential, um, uh, the preferential uh, maintaining of that which is benef- beneficial to complexity and the erosion of that which is obsolescent or isn't producing complexity. And we can see that in action with things like uh, biological evolution. We can see that in action with the actions of the, the decay of uh, stars and, and of uh, subatomic particles. Yes. So essentially, we, we can see the evidence of a numerical... I mean, uh, Stephen Wolfram... I mean, this is the other... You, you mentioned that various scientists are coming to this, these inescapable conclusions... But largely, the, the specialisation of the sciences, the reason why I've apparently arrived at this elegant model um, with which to use as a metaphor to describe these things, is simply because I completely lack all of those specialisms. I have been forced in my explorations of my own experience to research into every field, into the occult, into esoteria, into the hard sciences into religions to try and explain my own personal experience. I mean, the, 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 the fact of the matter was that, that there were only two reasonable conclusions to draw from the experiences that I had been having, and that was either that I was, um, uh, was travelling through time somehow and experiencing things in a completely different realm, or I was completely insane. And largely, I spent most of those years just simply concluding that I must be insane <laughs> because I came from the very strict gold standard Newtonian uh, mechanistic model. And, and I was the very first to jump down people's throats when they began talking what I believed was woo-woo nonsense at me. Yeah. And now suddenly I find that a lot of this woo-woo nonsense is actually completely bound up within the rule set of this model for reality that appears to... Um, it doesn't overthrow anything that's gone before it. The glory of digital virtual reality is that it's, it, it allows every other uh, field of endeavour to be contained within a, a sub, as a subset within it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, Tom Campbell calls it my big toe, uh, my big theory of everything. Yeah. And uh, theory of everything is a, is a simplified version of unified field theory. Yeah. Um, this is essentially a theory that describes all... Uh, um, uh, all discovered and observed data, which, frankly, the Newtonian model, the the, the uh, dogmatic sort of um, primacy of matter model, just simply doesn't go anywhere to explaining. And we had things like the quantum paradox, where the scientific model that was required to describe the quantum uh, realm and the scientific model that was used to describe the Newtonian realm were just acknowledged to be incompatible. Well, that's ridiculous. You know, I mean, we have a single, a single subject of physics relying on two completely different descriptions of reality and just simply shrugging in their shoulders and going, Pfft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, just, just for the listeners there, just, um, you should uh, all download Freeman's uh, pod with Tom Campbell. It's excellent reading. It's uh, definitely, it's definitely worth uh, listening to uh, Tom Campbell. Campbell as a, a, I don't think anywhere on the internet have I seen a, a bad uh, comment about Tom Campbell. Funnily enough, I did my, I always do my negative research on all of my um, potential guests, and Tom Campbell was the f- first one that I had come across. The only negative comment that I was able to found, find about him anywhere on the internet started with, uh, I watched the first half an hour of your video. Yeah. Uh, go <laughs> at, which away. Point, yeah. at which point I decided that I would read the first half of their comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's that's a fantastic uh, interview. It was a uh, was it was very well done, and uh, he he was a gentleman, and you were a gentleman. Uh, came came across very well. And uh, again, the, the glory of being able to discuss things like this with Tom is that he has actually got a model that is a reasonable uh, a reasonable description that contains all of my experiences without any, any paradox. Yeah. I, 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 when I went back to college a few years ago, I was, it was an engineering degree, but it was done in the, uh, the science section of the college, so it was, a, it was a science and engineering degree. 
But um, I'm certainly no scientist and, and I'm certainly no um, no academic. But I, I, I watched Tom Campbell's uh, My Theory of Everything and I watched a few of his, of his um, videos and I done a bit of research on him. And I, and I went on with questions to me, me uh, physics lecture and my maths lecture and uh, they just they just poo-pooed it. Um, it was beyond them. I knew it was beyond them. Uh, well, did you did you watch that um, Isaac Asimov uh, memorial lecture? No, I sent you the yes, link. Yes, yes, I did, I did, I did, I did. Do you, Do you remember the the response from that panel when they're presented with a fellow, a fellow genuine uh, research physicist presenting them with his data and the yes. best that they can do about it is a nervous laugh and a, can we please move on quickly. Yeah, can we please? Uh, that was a uh, one hour and something like six minutes into that lecture. Mm-hmm. Uh, just explain to to, to to people there on the on the it, chat box about basically that. basically it's a um, uh, a research physicist talking to a panel of uh, physicists about physics to a audience of physicists and uh, physics students, and he presents what he has found in the in the mathematical algorithms that drive quantum theory and what he has found is computer code not something that looks like computer code it actually is computer code not only is it computer code it's a very specific type of computer code it's a machine code it's the same code that google uses to um uh, to um refine search engine results unbelievable Okay, and when you feed, when you load this this software onto a computer and run it, it generates these beautiful fractal images. And they are beautiful, absolutely They're, stunning. Yeah, exactly. And 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 all of all that this group of scientists can possibly do about this revelation about their subject is titter, giggle, and hopefully move on very quickly. Yeah, I don't also, think. I don't I think, think I was he was. Also, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say. I think I also sent you the link to uh, some of the um, Ted um, Eric Lathwaite. No. Okay. Well, um, uh, certainly uh, most of my peers should remember the Eric Lathwaite uh, children's Christmas lectures from the early seventies. Oh yes, and yes, yes. You did. You did. I remember it now. He was the uh, inventor of the maglev train. Yes, and a highly respected uh, scientist. I mean, and and those lectures that he gave for eight to twelve year olds were the most inspiring, awesome things ever to have happened in my childhood. I mean, seriously, just uh, completely changed my life. Yeah. Um, and he treats the the audience as an adult audience. There is nothing about those lectures that is even remotely uh, aimed at a child or ch- a child's audience. Yeah. And in those lectures, I mean, he does things like he gets an eight-year-old out of the audience and gives them a 180-pound flywheel on the, four foot, on the end of a four-foot pole. And by spinning it up to 200 RPM, this eight-year-old child is able to lift it over his head. Yes, I remember. Yes. Yes. Uh, and basically, Eric Lathwaite got, got ostracised by the scientific community for mounting a, uh, a piece of wood, a plank of wood on a roller skate, perpendicular to the wheels and by swinging the pendulum and yes. ushering the roller skate in one direction. So basically if you swing the pendulum, the roller skate will rock backwards and forwards. If you give it a slight push in one direction, it will continue going in that direction. Yes. And Eric Lathwaite's question was, how does the pendulum change through 90 degrees to drive the roller skate forward? Yes. And that was the reason why I sent you that particular part of that lecture, because in there he's showing how electromagnetism appears to be polarised. Yes, down with that sort of thing, Jack. Uh, how dare he um, broadcast that on television? How dare he get children interested in science? Uh, let's put the comics back on and the cartoons. Let's put on Scooby-Doo. Mm. Those programmes are all gone now. Mm. You imagine... Uh, I, I still watch the children's lectures just out of interest, to be quite honest. And they yeah. are they are absolute farce now. Yeah, they, they. I can't imagine what child would actually want to bother to sit through one because they're so talked down to and and belittled by the subject material. Yeah, 
which is a real shame. That is a real shame. I, I actually remember, I, I, I was very young, but I remember catching the tail end of those those uh, those shows. I remember that, man. Once you sent me the link, I, I, I could just remember. Just barely... It is one of those, oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, he was great. Yeah. He was the one with the flying aluminium plates. and <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. But anyway, getting back to the subject, uh, yes, so what, what we're saying is that the reality is digital. Um, it's in the ether. Would I be right in saying there's there's an ether? There's like a a, a, a mix of soup. Well, I mean, if it's if it's virtual, then actually no, there would have to be some sort of a computational structure, and that's what I that's my uh, computational mainframe piece is actually an attempt to dis- to describe a physical structure that could exist virtually and project a holographic reality yeah. because this is some of my problems with this are things like how comes when I leave the room, my bookcase is still on the wall as far as everybody else is concerned. Yes. I mean, there's issues like, I mean, with um, persistence with digital yes. virtual reality theory. And I struggle with the concept of persistence in digital virtual reality theory. So I went to look for an answer. And I found uh, in some of the mad ramblings of the glorious Buckminster Fuller, who is completely impossible to watch and will completely rot your brain trying to concentrate. Mad, barking mad. Barking mad. Made up his own words for for things. Made up his own language. Absolutely. Would make them off, yeah, would make up words off off the cuff if he couldn't think of the word to describe whatever he was wanting to describe. He would (laughs) make up a new word for it. Um, But his... uh, his, uh, his presentation of tetrahedral uh, geometry uh, just suddenly struck me. I was doing lots of base 12 research and ge- geometri- uh, sacred geometry research at the time. And there was something about that lecture. I think it was his Everything I Know lecture, which is about three and a half hours long. And how I picked up this one yeah. little gem out of there, I have no idea because my mind must have just been melting by the time it comes on. It's about an hour and a half in. Uh, but he basically says that because we exist on the surface of a sphere, that the dimensions that we experience are not best described with a cube. That although we build roughly cubic buildings and and uh, in small scale geometry, cubic things are easy for our minds to grasp. When you actually think truly about the geometry of nature, you have to think about it tetrahedrally. That the 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 plumb walls of your buildings are in fact not parallel they're in fact describing a a triangular path to the center of the earth if you put a a a a spirit level on one wall and a spirit level on the other wall that spirit level isn't reading the parallel between the two walls it's actually reading straight downwards okay and the straight downwards from each of those two walls is actually a different tangent it's so tiny yes. that you don't notice it on the scale that we work at. Yeah, yeah. But what this means is that everything in our world is described with an up and down axis, <coughs> which is actually an in and out. Yes? Because yeah. <laughs> up is actually out and down is actually in. Um, and... Uh, I mean, Buckminster Fuller would insist that his students stopped thinking about upstairs and downstairs and think about them as instairs and outstairs. Yeah, that's Just correct. simply as, a, yeah. as an intellectual tool yeah. to correct this thinking. And when you start to, to uh, understand this, when you're, when you're dealing with uh, segments of a sphere, if you take a quarter of a sphere, that describes a tetrahedron, a three-sided sort of computa- computational mainframe. Uh, it struck me that uh, a tetrahedral grid would indeed be able to um, uh, sort of transmit uh, tidal waves of information and that the tidal waves of information uh, could interact in exactly the same way as pebbles in a pond interact when the ripples meet and you end up with an interference pattern. And for a long time, I've been working on the fact that uh, if this is a digital hologram, then it would have to be based around interference patterns. It would have to be the interplay of more than one data stream in order to be able to come. I mean, the the the, the usual example, which is sort of a, a steam cloud, mm-hmm. 
with uh, lasers shining onto the steam cloud and constructing the image in midair. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, the way that's done is that every time that a, a laser crosses over another laser, you get a bright spot. Yes. Okay, so the lasers are scanned across each other to make these light bright spots in midair. Yes. Well, that's pretty much the same way that this interpolated wave of algorithms would uh, interact to we, create are, a holographic uh, holographic reality. Are we talking frequencies? Are we talking different frequencies? ...to have created it in the first place. Yeah. So what we're saying is that the reality is uh, geometric... And would we be right in saying that it has the three dimensions of like uh, space and time and space time direction? Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, yeah. So the three three dimensions of, of space and one of time. Yeah. Although, again, time thinking of time as a dimension is is a bit of a misnomer because it's. And this is the other thing as well is that it's it, 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 most people would think about base twelve and just think, oh well, that's the numbers naught to eleven. And think no more of that. But of course, in that, the numbers 10 and 11 are actually base 10 concepts. Yeah, you get unique numbers, two unique numbers in that. You need two unique numbers. Yeah. And those we are not given. Yeah. I mean, I have done my research. There is nobody has done this work. It would. It strikes me that the only way of unthinking base 10... That the brain, the brain isn't the mind. The brain is sort of like an antenna or a receptor, which which we use to uh, pick up... Decode. Decode, decode and pick up the frequency uh, of, of this reality. The um, mind would appear to be out there. Outside, yeah, outside. So you're out of your mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> most be, of the time. Yeah, most of the time, same as that. But... Um, so where does how come my life differs from your life? How come my perceptions uh, how can I get this out? How come my perceptions, my life differs from I, I get different I get different things out of different information that you than, than what you would get? How come uh, are all our lives are the individual or as a collective? Both. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's no quite simple answer there. Yeah, no, we, go ahead. We are um, like the fingers of a hand, but we are ignorant of our connection to the hand. We all think of ourselves as individual. We can all look at each other and go, well, I, I mean, the little finger looks at the thumb and goes, well, I don't look anything like you. Yeah. Middle finger looks at the index finger and goes, I'm much bigger than you. Yeah. yeah. And all of them are completely ignorant of the fact that they're connected to a hand. Yeah. And to some degree, some of these experiences in non-ordinary reality are a matter of returning to the hand. Uh, I often compare it to um, uh, the way that an amoeba behaves. When an amoeba is moving around its environment, it basically uh, sends out a tentacle, a tentative tentacle, a thin tendril, and senses the environment. And if it finds something beneficial, some food or something somewhere that it thinks is going to be heading towards food it basically pours its entire body into that tentacle. And that's how an amoeba actually moves. And sometimes it feels for me like I'm pouring in and out of parts of myself. Yeah. And certainly there's never been any, in all of my experiences in non-ordinary reality, there has never been any awareness of me being anyone other than me, even when I've been a dog or a wolf <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that- I was entirely me while being the wolf and thinking... Why the hell am I only two foot off the ground? Why am I running so fast? Why am I running so fast in the dark? Oh, that branch is going to get me in the eye. Oh, wow, I managed to miss it. And these are kind of the, the intellectual thoughts that are happening while I'm experiencing being a wolf. Yes. And, did, and did, you, did, you, did you get that through your psychedelic experience or did you get that through your epilepsy? Uh, those, those particular ones were petty males. They were epile- epilepsy. Right, and as that possibly, uh, possibly induced, I mean, largely, you know, I mean, uh, as an epileptic, I really don't advise anybody to go doing what I did with psychedelics. I would routinely induce really over the top fits through my consumption of psychedelics, and most of my non ordinary reality experiences were, in fact, due to near death uh, experiences brought about due to the extremity of the fits that I'd induced due to my consumption of psychedelics. So it's right. <laughs> not a good thing out there, kids. No, you know? <laughs> definitely not, definitely not. <laughs> this is something to do if you already consider that you're clinically insane and beyond help. 
yeah. largely. And this is really how I've ended up kind of the sort of tribal shaman that uh, I've always been kind of viewed as by my peers. It's just simply because I've always been prepared to go out there to the to the the, the extremities of experience and bring back whatever I find. Yeah. And I suppose my sort of common man approach allows me to then decant that what I find for my fellow man. Yeah. And it it allows them not to have to do the, <laughs> the hardcore drug abuse to be able to achieve the revelation. Yeah. Sort of thing. So uh And and where does novelty fit into all this, uh Jack? Where wh- you know, well, novelty, novelty is a primary drive of evolution. Evolution is simply the production of novelty and the maintenance of uh, beneficial novelty and the erosion of detrimental novelty. So if, uh, you know what I mean, uh, diabetes is an evolutionary adaptation. In some respects, there's bound to be some particular civilization at some point where their diet meant that the the insulin deficiencies or whatever of a di- of diabetes was a beneficial adaptation and that's why it's been maintained within the genome yeah so you know I mean, we we only have to look at at the biology around us to see how uh um an adaptive self adaptive machine can produce biological forms yeah and then my suggestion would be that having then produced the biological forms, the next dimension that it had to uh, explore complexity through was conscious animals. Okay. And that's where you get the higher animals, the dolphins, the whales, us, monkeys, dogs, self-aware animals. Okay, so novelty, could, would I be right in saying that novelty is, uh, ooh, let me see, it's, it's nature, it's the survival of the fittest, and we, we are novelty... Um, we I don't know if it's, even, it's not necessarily even survival of the fittest. That's that's a very much maligned term and probably not very appropriate to use. It's more survival of the most um, unique. Yeah, the most adaptive. So if you come up with a unique adaptive skill that then gives you a, a benefit simply in diet. You know what I mean? Uh, for us, it was probably the reason why we're these hairless apes is because we probably discovered mussels and, and um, seaweed Mm-hmm. And became uh, sort of came down from being arboreal apes to being shoreline apes, and so it wasn't yeah. a, you know when it wasn't a, the ability to conduct war on other apes; it was just simply a change of diet. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Certainly, certainly, there's there, there's there's some suggestion that there has to be some explanation for the uh, expansion in the human brain as an organ because of the amount of omega three, which is the fish oil that is required to actually produce a human brain, and it just simply wasn't there in the diets of the, the higher apes. Yeah. It seems to me that um, we're heading towards an age um, of more, like the, the computer power, I think it's a, it's a double every... every it's, 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 18 three, months, more. How it is, something like that. Doubling, uh, doubling capacity and halving size every 18 months. Right, so we, we can... Um, Eventually, we'll, we'll be able to create our own realities and just plug into it and forget all our troubles. Um, well, first of all, I would suggest that Moore's law has already been breached and is probably five years on the far side of it. But the stock exchange don't want to tell you that because it would collapse them. What's Moore's um, law? Let's do a, that's uh, this resist. doubling. This doubling in every eighteen months. Oh, is yeah, yeah, Moore's okay. law. Um, and essentially it's driven the, the computer revolution that this assumption has always been held to be true, and it was true up until five years ago. It is no longer true. Computers are now no faster than they were five years ago. They're simply five times more complex and yes. have reduced in size. Uh, that isn't actually going to carry on much further. We're already reaching yeah, uh, no. the limits of uh, nano tunneling on the size of the disk. We've got things like graphene in the pipeline, which may revolutionise it a degree. But again, we're not talking. But when it comes to plugging into our own our own reality, you already are. Yeah, you're on it. You're already in your own digital virtual reality. And the reality that you construct from your own digital virtual reality is driven by your own paradigms and your own preconceptions. Yeah. So everything that you've been taught, everything that you've thought, everything that you think that you know 
constructs the reality that you experience. Tom says that it's about 80-20. Personally, I say if it is 80-20 and 20% of it is imposed and 80% of it is personal, that 20% that is imposed is still subject to your personal in- interpretation. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you could, you could make that 20% sort of run your life more. Than, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Exactly. So yeah. essentially, it's 100% at your disposal. There may be calamities and there may be uh, controversies and, and catastrophes in that experience, but how you uh, how you experience those calamities, catastrophes, etc., is entirely down to your own conception. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a glorious, a glorious uh, revelation when I realised that I made Streatham snotty. I was driving back through a rain soaked. I was driving back through a rain soaked Streatham begrudging every red traffic light, hating every moment of this dirty, grim existence. And suddenly the dawning of MBT struck me in that moment and I realised that I made Streatham grotty. And ever since, I've been making Streatham a nice sunny place with tree-lined and my experience of Streatham is now completely different. I enjoy driving through Streatham. Genuinely enjoy driving through Streatham. My experience of Streatham has changed entirely. Mitchum is a different matter. (laughs) 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 <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry anybody that lives in Mitchell that was a bit of a sly quip but yeah do you, you know what I mean yeah, yeah. essentially anything that you don't like about your experience the first thing that you have to analyse is why am I why am I creating this for myself yeah. and I know that some people have got you know, I mean, grave problems with things like cataf- catastrophes you know what I mean global catastrophes well did that uh, little girl ask to be you know what I mean create the man who shot her and these are very difficult questions to ask, answer but again, like I say, this is a model. It may not be complete. It may not answer all the questions, but it bloody answers more than most. And it leaves you with a a rational way of exploring your own experience. And, and that's you, what we're here for. Do you think that um, this, this, this knowledge has been uh, suppressed and hidden from us and been no, maybe... No, I think they have no goddamn idea this is what i'm getting from the scientific community every time i come across an example like that that i gave you with the asimov lecture yeah every time i come stephen wolfram is a perfect example stephen wolfram wrote mathematica i mean the man is an absolute genius and he saw biology in maths yeah he saw biological forms falling out of his mathematics yeah and and he constructed a computer program that would generate these mathematical biological forms And instead of exploring how the two compare, how natural biology and mathematical biology actually compare and what perhaps is driving the two, he then went on to to monetize his discovery and is now, Mathematica is now a a mainstream uh, computational tool for scientists and engineers and probably doing much greater good with it. But Mm. he seems to have completely missed the point. He seems to have missed his own point. That's the thing I I, th- I see in the scientific world is that that if you're a physicist you're a physicist if you're a biologist you're a biologist if you're a chemist you're a chemist and never the twain shall meet well, and I exactly. think that's that's a lot of lot of the problems there exactly and and possibly one of you know I mean one of my uh, saving graces is my complete lack of academic training that I've had to do this myself so I haven't been constrained by any fields or any colleagues looking down their nose at me I mean everybody looked down their nose at me everybody's just completely viewed me as a nutter and uh, I've got used to that it's only been recently that anybody's been going oh blimey you know you might actually be honest I'll I'll, I'll tell you something I've I've been watching a lot of Charles Manson's uh, interviews on on YouTube and ten years ago, I would have said Charles Manson's another. Yeah. Uh, Charles Manson makes absolute sense to me. Mm. The yeah, things he comes no, out. I, I just think he, the man was about. Uh, I even stole his old man. I think he's about fifty years ahead of his time. Mm. Uh, he comes. I get, funny you should mention that, but this is actually a key point as well. Is that all of humanity? If you take any um, measurement of human experience and plot it on a graph you will end up with something called the bell curve. Yes. And this is basically a bell-shaped uh, plot on the graph under which all of humanity is contained. Yeah. And in the, the, the top of the bell, we've got the most, the majority of humanity is under that sort of main banner. Um, 
sort of 80 90 percent of humanity will fall within those sort of 20 or 30 percent of the of the graph mm-hmm. and at the front edge and the back edge of the graph you have the extremities of experience yeah yeah and at the at the back end of the graph obviously you've got the people that would be considered to be dullards or uh luddites or stick in the muds yeah yeah and at the or in terms of physical performance weaklings you know what i mean uh you know what i mean whatever and at the at the at the front edge of the curve essentially you've got the the psychiatric patients yeah their experience of reality is so far outside of consensus reality that that they've they've got no way of interacting with normal society and that's really some where where i've found myself to in large parts of my my life i have been so uh, incoherently blathering about my discoveries that I have just simply been viewed as insane, and quite rightly so. I probably would have come across to any normal, reasonable person as somebody who had completely lost the plot. Yeah, well, losing the plot and and being insane are two different things. I mean, if you think of the words insane, I see someone, if if someone says to me that person is insane, I don't think that person's mad or, 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 or uh, um, I don't know what, what word I could use for it. I don't see it as that. I see it as a different viewpoint. They, uh, they, they see things. If you look at the word uh, for dyslexic, I think it goes back to Latin, and it means abnormal. And I looked it up, and it actually means that uh, you have a, a, an abnormal means that you, you look at the world in a different way. Now, you may have trouble writing, you may have trouble uh, reading and with numbers, but that doesn't mean that you're any less, your brain's any less uh, powerful than my brain or anyone else's is, brain. I would actually suggest that the that, that, um, that, uh, psychological disturbances like um, schizophrenia yeah. would be much less prevalent if people had a grasp of what non-ordinary reality. Yes, Correct. Consists of, because then their experiences, they wouldn't have to associate with madness. Correct. They wouldn't have to associate with uh, uh, medication and with uh, the, the so-called normal reality that we're supposed to live on. I mean, I, certainly, I, somebody who's ambulatory um, within ordinary reality while experiencing non-ordinary reality can obviously be a danger to themselves and to others. And, and obviously, we do need some of the caring professions to look after the poor people like that. But most people's um, delusional states are simply that. They're minor delusions and uh, can simply be con- conscribed to non-ordinary reality and not trouble yeah. them in their ordinary daily life at all. I I'm reminded of the time, gentlemen. It's uh, two minutes till by, by my clock. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going into nine o'clock. Do you want to go for a cigarette break? Oh, right. Oh, superb. I could do with a refill on my cup of tea. Well, no so, bother. So you now, to, uh, a whack a tune on. Uh, a couple of songs from Johnny there, and uh, we'll come back after the break. And uh, if there's any questions in the chat, but... all right, folks, and uh, welcome back. Uh, I've got Freeman Jack here with me, and uh, just before the break, there we were talking about the nature of reality and what Jack's uh, opinion of reality is, and the tools that he's modelled it on. And uh, I would I would agree with everything he says. Uh, I've looked into it. Um, it's a heavy subject. It's a hard old subject to get your head around. Um, the only reason that I was able to get sort of a, a basic, and I mean a very, very basic grasp on the subject matter, is that uh, I would have studied physics, I would have studied science, I would have done uh, mathematics at, 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 at college, at university level. So I would have a, have a basic concept of what he's saying. And uh, there's a saying that uh, I heard one time in, in college, and it came from a maths lecture, that uh, biology boils down to chemistry, chemistry can boil down to physics, and physics boils down to maths, and maths is a universal language. But anyway, I've got Jack back here again now, and just for this, for this, the last hour of the show, Jack, um, take it down to a human level, and what does it mean for you as a as a personal, if you if you like, want to answer the question, what does it mean to you to be a sovereign? Um, how do you go about it in your daily life, and 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 where do you where do you, how do you come across it? You know. Well, first of first of all, um, I I've always been um, a, a free thinker, a bit of a um, an independent soul, 
And so, you know, I mean, having lived as a new age traveller, having lived amongst the, the biker scene, having lived amongst the squat scene, um, having sort of a large brand, uh, branch of sort of artists, musicians and what, what have you amongst my peers, um, I've always understood that um, freedom was a matter of independent thought more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, the capacity to hold your own beliefs and uh, to to uh, to try not to be ignorant about the source of those beliefs. So, if you believe something, try and find out about that belief and find out whether or not that belief is justified. Um, and so, I suppose uh, sovereignty wasn't really an uh, uh, a specific term that I encountered other than in terms of royalty, etc. cetera, um, up until really very recently, up until the sort of um, joining things like the TPUC. Um, hopefully most people know that my name predates the, the modern um, British Freeman movement and actually stems back to my time as a New Age traveller. Um, but uh, when I came across the concept of sovereignty. In fact, I think it's Vin largely that educated me about the concepts of sovereignty. And then on doing my research in digital virtual reality, on realising that we are the uh, projector of our own part of consensus reality, that we project our 80% of consensus reality out into the world. We're not the receivers of reality. We are actually the projectors of it the net creators of reality, that as a creator, you are uniquely sovereign. There is no question about your sovereignty. There is no higher authority. Yes. You are your own creator. You are the creator of your own reality. Yes. So I then was completely struck by the sense of duty and responsibility that came. It's overwhelming, isn't it? Sometimes when you think about it, it's, it's overwhelming. It, I try not to get overwhelmed. If I'm if I feel overwhelmed by a subject, I I I, I do my best to uh, ignore that feeling because that's certainly something that has been imposed on us, yeah, to a large extent, and is something that the media is very much largely responsible for creating. Dumbing the dumbing down of civilization, yeah, is almost completely accomplished. Um, a fait accompli. Um, so yeah, I, I do my best never to be overwhelmed by a subject. I mean, I, I, to, to the extent that I very nearly burnt my brains out working on that tetrahedral maths theory yeah, yeah. before before I had the uh, the numerical model. To well, if, work you, with. if you look through uh, history and you look at a lot of the mathematicians that that come up with formulas and breakthroughs, an awful lot of them committed suicide and and and, and a lot awful lot of them were in, in mental institutions because they seen a, they, they got a concept of reality that uh, the normal person can't really deal with. Yeah, well, I mean, this is and this is one of the things as well is that the um, my experiences in in non ordinary reality uh, may have been extraordinary, but what's I think possibly more extraordinary extraordinary is that they're never remembered directly like a dream. The memory of them is usually stimulated at some later point as a as a kind of deja vu experience, yeah. and the actual experience of returning to ordinary reality to consensus reality is one of complete absence of any awareness of the preceding interval. Yeah, it would appear that the um, the incongru- incongruity, the the in um, uh, 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 the fact that the two realities can't mesh because of their model of reality. Yeah. So because these two, the, because there's no way of joining these two versions of reality that they've just experienced in their current mod- model under their current p- paradigm, the brain just simply rejects it. Yeah. The mind kind of fudges over it. Yeah. And it's usually at a later date. And this is, uh, I, I suppose, really, um, I should really use a few examples of uh, how extreme some of these sort of non-ordinary reality experiences have been and some of the things that sort of 
persuaded me to look further into them and not simply to write them off as delusional, which, again, is something that I had done for many years. This is something that has happened to me since childhood. And in childhood, I would more often than not um, uh, sort of incarnate into non-ordinary reality as things. So I would often be a talking thing and that my non-ordinary reality as a child was very much more fantastical and and, um, world of imagination. Yes. Clearly, the world of imagination. And the, the, uh, the more adult I became, the more convincing non-ordinary reality became, the more ordinary non-ordinary reality became. And I would begin to experience completely ordinary everyday events through non-ordinary reality, but with a time frame and a place that's completely different to where I was experiencing them from. Yeah. So I began to have experiences of fully non-local mind where my mind was not with my body. It was still my mind. I was still me. I was yeah, still but, experiencing the world as me, but I was not in the chair yeah. where my body was. I yeah. was somewhere else. Yeah. Um, uh, with some of these experiences, I actually came back with uh, information that I just simply couldn't have acquired any other, any other way. Um, uh, in other experiences, in one in particular, I spoke with a... Uh, it's actually the only one that I, have, that I can remember where I spoke out loud... And I spoke out loud with a soft Irish accent and really startled <laughs> myself. You're right, OK. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, you know what I mean? I, I suddenly was in this phone box. Oh, yeah, I remember you told me that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and had the phone in my hand and was just completely in a phone box, talking on the phone, you know what I mean? There's nothing weird about it. I was in a phone box. Yeah. Only when I went to open my mouth to talk to whoever it was that I was talking to on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> broad soft Irish accent which, which I remember being startled by but that that experience was so short lived and so extraordinary in its kind of impact that it was just too much to even think of when I returned to ordinary reality I mean that literally would have been a matter of two or three seconds yeah. of ordinary time Yeah, and I travelled to a completely different place and the experience then as well was one that I disbelieved the the recollection of it, that there were things about it that I disbelieved that, that told me that this was somehow imagination or fantasy. And later I had corroborated as bloody the, the actual reality of what would have happened under those events. So my, percept, my preconception of what that event would have been like was at odds with what the, the event was like. But then later I discovered that, no, actually, that's what it would have been like. How did you have been there? Yes. Yeah. And uh-huh. this again is an uh, is another experience that that's absolutely generic to non ordinary reality experiences is that of disbelief. When yeah. you come back, you can't believe that you've just been to where you you've been. Yeah. You can't believe that you can have acquired something from there that that other people haven't got or don't know or yeah. couldn't experience. It's because it was just ordinary. Yeah. Yeah. When I, when I, run of them all, whole home, run of them all reality. Mm. Yeah. Well, when I when I slipped into sort of I don't know the seventeen hundreds or whatever it was, I was there walking up the road, cussing the the council for stripping off the tarmac, and leaving us with bare bloody cobblestones, and oh, thinking how how much of a nightmare that hill was going to be to drive down in the winter. And <laughs> there I am walking around in bloody seventeenth century. Yeah, yeah. You see, what, what, bloody road, bloody road planners. What the what are they thinking of? Why, why, I, why? I was hoping you'd come on. I, was, and I know you were supposed to be on last weekend, but I, I was glad that you come on tonight. But the reason why I wanted you on is that uh, when when I was away the last time, we had some good conversations over Skype, and uh, just today in the chat box earlier on today, okay, there was a bit of a debate going on about when the first uh, sovereign constitution of Ireland was released. Of of era, sorry, it was released. Some people are saying it's, it's nineteen nineteen. Some people are saying it's nineteen twenty nine. Well, what I'm trying to get across, uh, especially in this interview, is that there is so much more to being sovereign than a piece of paper. Uh, it doesn't matter. See, Billy McGuire. There is no piece of paper that can exactly, give you exactly. Uh, uh, Van Van Billy McGuire, sovereignty, and different people have educated me. On my so- on on me and how to be sovereign. Okay, they have educated me that I was always sovereign. Uh, they can't take it away from me. Uh, they can't say to me. They c- no one can point to a date. The only date that I can point to is my birthday, the day I was born. And um, the only the other date I can point to is today because it's what I do today. 
So there is no piece of paper anywhere. There is no person anywhere. It's not written in stone anywhere that says when I was sovereign and when I wasn't sovereign. I came to the realization when I came to TNS uh, that I was a sovereign because it was it was told to me that I was in charge of me. I was in control of me. At, at not necessarily freedom. I think if you're sovereign, it's not freedom. It's slightly more constrained. It's it's more constrained because you have to follow a certain uh, rule book because you have to respect the other person's sovereignty. If you're free uh, in the in the in the total sense of freedom, like you 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 can do whatever you want and with no consequences. That's what I see the freedom as. But when you're sovereign, there's consequences to your action. You walk a narrow path, and and this thing about uh, when the constitution, the first constitution, was sent out, it means nothing and it should mean nothing to anyone only historians because we have moved on from that and the way that i come into this site is that all my preconceptions all my uh insecurities and fears are left outside the door i come on to the chat box i like to shoot the shit and have a bit of crack with the people i listen to other people's opinions and i try and get my opinion across and all my prejudices are left outside. And then whenever I get off MSI, I might take those prejudices back on again. And, and, and that's the way life is. But eventually, when you keep coming back to the site, those prejudices, someday you'll just say, I don't want to lift those. I don't want them anymore. And, I, and that's where I've got to at the minute. So it doesn't matter to me if it was 1919, 1929, 19... It's like sitting in 1999, it doesn't bother me because I am sovereign and I don't need a date and I don't need a piece of paper. The only thing that I would suggest that is important about uh, Irish sovereignty is simply that I believe that a nation can only be truly sovereign if it's a uh, democratic republic or uh, through democrat the democratic republic process yes. has decided, elected as a body to run some alternative yes. version of governance. You know, I mean, as far as I'm aware, as far as I'm concerned, a sovereign nation can choose a dictator for all I care. Yes. Yeah, if that's their, their sovereign de- democratic choice, then so be it. You know, right. I mean, as long as On a national it. level, and we're, we, we're, not at that, we're not at that level yet in this country, and that's why MSA well, is well, here. To a degree, you are so far head and shoulders above anything that we have in this country because at least you have a written constitution to be able to point to and that constitution, to some degree, protects the people. Yeah. I whereas, think, here, I, whereas here we've got meaningless pieces of paper that weren't even ratified by the, the bodies that would have made them official pieces of paper. Well, I think the evolution, I don't call it revolution anymore, I think the evolution mm. of human consciousness is going to come from this country. I think that this country was uh, deliberately kept down uh, we are the, we're the wealthiest nation in Europe, and we've been deliberately robbed, starved for a reason. And I think mm. it's the reason is that the, the peoples here were islanders. We're we're off from the from the mainland of Europe. Uh, we're it's b- entirely possible that you're actually the primary primary descendants of an entirely seafaring nation. Yes, there's that to it as well. There is that. There, uh, there's 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 the cottages, the Stonecroft cottages, um, all around the inlets uh, around um, Sky, um, some of the inlets around Scotland and in the the Scandinavian coast. And they couldn't work out what they were. They were these stone uh, elliptical buildings with a hearth, but no roof structure. Yes. And they suddenly realised that they were exactly the same size as a as a um, two man coracle. Yeah, and 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 the, so they basically sail inland and then upend their that's boat. That's correct. If, they, if the weather got bad while they're out at the sea, that's correct, and use it for a shelter. Um, there, there is no definite one hundred percent proof. There's a lot of theories out there where we came from. Um, but there is no one. Some people say the south of Spain. Some people say further. There is no definite proof of where we came from. Well, again, this kind of goes with my naked ape theory of us having been coastal dwellers. Uh, as we uh, evolved out of arboreal apes, we would have evolved into a coastal dwelling ape, hence we lost all the all the fur because it would have simply got in the way in the sea, uh, where we acquired the aquiline nose because most of the great apes can't put their heads underwater without drowning. Yeah. 
Uh, there's quite a few sort of biological adaptations. Our um, hair follicles are all aligned for the um, runoff of water when we're yeah. upright. So there's all those sort of... We're definitely designed as an aquatic ape, and there aren't any other aquatic apes, so it would suggest that the origins of humanity are coastal. And if that's the case, then it would only be it would be a very short yeah. intellectual leap from a coastal bald ape to a uh, I mean an ocean going yeah bald ape on a log. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a thought, Jack. <laughs> that's quite a thought, man. Well, this is it. I mean, all of the all of the, the evolutionists all pursue um, land based migration patterns to try and explain human evolution. Yeah. And they all completely ignore the possibility of an entirely seafaring race. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and I, I, like I say, I suspect that the the original Pictish peoples um, uh, were probably pre Ice Age, and as such, the uh, English landmass would have been exposed as part of the European continent, and so uh, they would have simply have been the the sort of coastal dwellers of that exposed um, European subcontinent edge, which would basically be, I mean, the extremities of Ireland, the extremities of Scotland, Shetland, Norway. Yeah. All of those would have been shallow coastland river, you know, I mean, inland inlets. Yeah. I know, uh, I know Michael Desarian, I know, uh, he, I know he's been debunked in a lot of stuff, uh, but he, he said that instead of, uh, Western philosophy is that all life came from um, all culture came from Egypt and worked its way over to us. And he, his theory is that all uh, culture came from here and worked its way because he believed in Atlantis. The Atlantis was, was between uh, America and uh, Europe, and that all all uh, life came from there and came to uh, Ireland first, and then hopped along across into. That's a theory, like you know, but it's, it's, mm. maybe it's, I don't hold with the the the, the Atlantean part mm, of it. But no, no, a, neither do I. No, no. There I is don't. certainly mounting evidence for a uh, eastward passage of um, a lot of. Um, what are now considered the um, the Eastern arts, you know, I mean, of languages and things, um, the uh, Vedic traditions. There's so there's about two hundred and fifty something or other points of coincidence between the known Vedic tra- the known ancient Vedic traditions and the known ancient Druidic traditions. Yeah, and that's just completely impossible by pure chance alone. There's the uh, tartan wearing ginger bearded skeletons that recently um, turned up China. in the Mongolian desert. Yeah, 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 and have been scurried away by the Chinese, who would rather they weren't talked about too much. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I think the whole, the the, the whole. Uh... Oh, we also just to add to that list, we also have the um, oh bloody hell, what was the civilization? Uh... One of the great uh, Mediterranean trading uh, states, Phoenician. Uh, we've got a, a Phoenician trading vessel uh, just been discovered off the coast of Cornwall, uh, four to six thousand years old, and yeah. it's on its return journey. It's loaded with ingots of tin and empty olive oil and wine. Yeah, fla- flagons. So yeah. it's basically like a milk float picking up the empties, yeah. and on its way home with its load of tin that it ex- exchanged for its. Latest load of olive oil. Yeah, I mean, we we even got maps that, that this is uh, possibly four thousand years before the Romans arrived. We're yeah. trading. We're a trading nation with yeah. one of the major European trading states. Yes, and trading in high value, high um, high end stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And metallurgy. This is the other point as well. Is that the the uh, a large part of metallurgy was drawn out of the the uh, mystic. Um, practices of the Druidic culture that most of their kind of wizardry was based around um, uh, metal elements. Yeah. I mean, throwing metal metal powders on a fire to get a blue flame or a green flame or yeah. to get a woo out of the audience, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Pop. through that, they discovered a lot of, the, they would have accidentally discovered a lot of the amalgams and, and uh, mixtures that then subsequently led to our modern metallurgy. Yeah, yeah. 
interesting. But even the maps, even what you're saying there with the fee, the, the, the seafaring uh, idea, even that we've got maps showing um, the North Pole as a landmass, um, mm-hmm. a detailed landmass, way, way before before anyone was up there, like, you know. And, and I, I think I think you find it's the Antarctic, but uh, the, the Arctic's just a big ice cap. But, yeah, no, the Antarctic, yeah. yes, there's, there's uh, um, uh, what's known to be an ancient map that shows what appears to be uh, the Antarctic subcontinent without the ice sheet. Yeah. And that hasn't been known for at least 10,000 years. That coastline hasn't yeah. been seen since before the last ice age. It's mental. It's absolutely mental. You see, this This is what it means to me to be sovereign. It means that, that, that I question everything. I question the, because the, 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 the view of history and the view of, the, especially the Irish history that I've been given is absolute rubbish. It's absolute tap. Uh, Irish history uh, ends with, um, you start with uh, the Sulk and Thomas and, and the rebellion uh, goes on through the different rebellions uh, against the, the occupation. It goes up to 1916, then it just dies. Irish history dies at 1916. We don't hear about the internment camps after the, the, after the Civil War, or the so-called Civil War, where uh, the, the Crown forces... Uh, wearing Irish uniforms turned their guns on Irish people. Um, mm-hmm. You don't get to see um, all of the, the, the hidden politics, all this trouble and strife during the 40s and 50s, uh, the, when we were supposed to be neutral, but we're, we're allowing uh, the U-boats. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. U-boats well, on one it's... side. And, sorry. There, well, there were there were a lot of uh, uh, there were a lot more reasons really for um, error to uh, side with the Germans due to their uh, various politics than there was to side with the English. A hundred percent. I can actually tell you that uh, they did side with the English uh, up round where not far from where I live. They, they said it was English because it was it was the occupied six counties. But uh, after World War One, uh, the the Crown forces had a, a glut of mustard gas and uh, poison gas, and they didn't know what to do with it. So they put it all into a, a couple of ships, and they sealed it off the coast of where I'm from, and they torpedoed it. And they sank it uh, to the bottom of the sea, so that uh, the pollution of the mustard gas and the poison gas was away from the the UK, and uh, mm. my coastline got it all. Very so, nice. Yeah, all lovely. Well, that's, uh, your, that's your great British Empire. For yeah, you, well, that's it. You know, and uh, I've I've heard I've heard the saying in this chat room. You know, that the reason why the sun never sat on the on the British Empire was because no one thrusted them in the dark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, and there's no disrespect to anyone who's British or from the UK. I'm talking about the Crown Forces. I'm talking about the Crown Forces that will do the same to you as they do to me. Uh, it's certainly no, no uh, uh, malice intended to anyone from from the. Well, I mean, there's there's another point as well is that the, the sort of um, the racism argument. Uh, I've done an awful lot of uh, research into genetics. My um, my oldest son actually uh, did a um, genetics and biochemistry degree at uh, university. Uh, he's now just about to start his uh, his PhD um, on the nineteenth. So I'm hugely proud of him. He's oh, excellent. Well done. Well done. Well done. A funded PhD at Edinburgh University. I mean, how how much could you possibly drop in shit and come out smelling of roses? Yeah. Um, Having grown up in Deptford, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, the the point being that genetics is uh, a description of the uh, the underlying agent of uh, the impatterning of a human biology, human body, and human biology. Yeah, but that base code is then acted on through an agent called phenotype, through the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, each cell is basically uh, its own little island, and it interacts through the world by, by a phenotype, via its environment, by the foods that it gets, the, uh, you know, in the energy that it acquires, the, the warmth or cold or whatever. Um, and that this biology actually physically changes DNA, it, okay. it, it switches, switches. It is, in fact, the, the mechanism by which the adaptations to the human body 
have evolved over the years. Yes. And those uh, adaptive changes, once they're set into the code as an available adaptation, it's, uh, it's possible to revert to type. So if you take away the phenotype pressure on the genome, then the genome will revert to type without that phenotype pressure to, to the new trait. Yes. And so as a consequence, the entire construct of racism and the, the whole uh, uh, apparent sort of um, uh, uh, attempts of the, the elites to maintain some sort of control and to uh, alter behaviours and to change this and to change that is in complete ignorance. Correct. Of the fact that if you're eating British spuds and you're eating British carrots and drinking British water and breathing British air, you're British. Yes. The colour of your skin is temporary. The, yes. The, you know, I mean, the, the, the accent in your language is temporary. Yes. All of, that, all of that will be adjusted by evolutionary pressure. Due yes, to phenotype. exactly. Uh, it's, it's like uh, on a watered-down version of that, Jack, it's like we're legend. If I was born in Egypt, I'd more than likely be a Muslim. I happened to be born in Ireland, therefore I didn't choose it. It, it, it was chosen for me. I, I was I was born or uh, uh, I was baptized into the Roman Catholic faith. If I was born in uh, Nigeria, I, I I could have been a Christian or I could have been a, a local uh, religion. You know, and you just hit on a great thing there about racism. You know, the. the it's a thing that people, especially white people, don't want to talk about. They don't want to debate because uh, uh, the politically correct, the way the way things are now at the moment, everything has to be politically correct. If I talk about racism, uh, if I if I I can talk about it to a certain degree in public, but if I go ab- beyond the pale and ask the really tough, difficult questions, people look at you and go, well, "That boy's a bit of a racist," and I'm I'm, I'm certainly not. Uh, you know. Um, I work in Africa, and uh, I, I can tell you this: racism bo- works both ways. I, I I've been called a cracker. I've been called a blue-eyed devil. I've been called mm. blood clot. I've been called uh, um, what was it? Something else? There was another. I can't remember. But I mean, they are derogatory terms, exactly, and they can be just as racist as me. Mm. You know, if, if I took that notion, they they I uh, I went to. Angola, which is a Portuguese colony, I was called a gringo. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it works both ways. Ignorance works both ways. Uh, it's not just uh, it's not just me. It's 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 the it's the society that's been bred under people. It's another well, I, it's another divide and conquer. Well, I, I may be uh, English born and bred, but uh, with uh, a mere drop of the Irish in me, I've got a quarter Irish in me, but. Um, uh, about a quarter of my family is West Indian, yeah, and my uh, wife is Spanish Italian, and therefore my children are Spanish Italian, English Irish. Yeah, my and, my uh, wife. Cute. We actually worked. We actually worked out where my wife should be sent home to. <laughs> should she be sent home? Well, these and vans the Cameron Centre. Yeah, go ahead. Go uh, home. It's, yeah. it's, it, it's thirty miles off the coast of um, uh, Sicily, in the middle of the Mediterranean. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? I hope she's <laughs> walk with her a boat if she uh, has to go home at any yeah. time. Oh, if she has to go home, you go with her, man. That sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> but uh, but my, my, my mother's ancestors came from Scotland. They were planters. They came over here. They were Protestant planters. They came over here back in the 17th century. My father, he, his name was Walsh, uh, and that translates to Welsh, and, and that comes from Wales. And uh, if you translate the word Wales, it means land of the foreigners. Um, so, I mean, I'm a mix of, of everything, you know? Yes. That's uh, funnily enough. My family name it, uh, translates to Strang, which comes from the same root as strange. There you go. Uh, there you go. She's also applied to foreigners. Yeah. There you go. So I, I see. This is the thing with the argument today in the chat. Not the argument. Sorry. The the, the debate in the chat room about uh, whether it was nineteen nineteen or nineteen twenty nine that the sovereign constitution was put out. You see, I have gone so far beyond that now. Uh, I don't even see some people called Ireland, some people called Era. I just called uh, a bit of land on a big blue rock in the middle of Troy, not even in the middle and 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 in space. Run. Oh, I I I claim an absolute 
sovereign territory of my own. Yeah. It's uh, it's the area that's uh, defined by the gap between my ears. Yes. That's, and all of its contents. And that all that is as 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 a receptor for the 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 mind that's outside us. That the, the which is a good point. We're we're twenty minutes before uh, uh, before nine, so I would love to uh, still go to areas where uh, I feel that this model could uh, really help people who are having uh, difficulties with um, irregular reality. Shall we call it of whatever kind? Go for free. Um, you go for. I like, give you the last twenty minutes. How's that? Okay, well, I mean, to, uh, to be quite honest, I'd like to refer to yourself even with your um, uh, broad Roman Catholic upbringing and the uh, the dogma that would have been imparted to you. How large a part do you now see that playing in your experience of non ordinary reality? Absolutely none. It's gone. It's, uh, uh, I treat the whole thing now as a fiction. Okay, no, what I meant is is, is now that you understand that that experience was probably a, protect, a projection of your own archetypal oh, uh, yes. fears, yeah. how much do you associate that projection of archetypal fears uh, stemming from the, the dogmatic sort of Roman yes. upbringing? It, 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 would have, it would have been... Uh, Yes, it would have been 99%. It would have been an absolute belief in the yes. existence of devils and demons. Yes. Is really where we're sort of going with this, and that is that is uh, such a huge problem to me. Uh, I, I have intellectually now completely rejected the concepts of good and evil. Yeah. And I know that we're kind of stro- straying in the Crowleyist territory there, but I, I, you know I mean, I reject no... Um, no previous considerations on it. I'm not prepared to follow their, you know what I mean, their considerations. I have considerations of my own, but if it's Crowley-esque, I don't really care. It's my own. It's not Crowley-esque. Okay. And, um, and if, basically, if this, if this is true, then essentially it describes everything from the, uh, the the occult power that occult sects uh, feel that, that they acquire from their occult practices and ceremonies. Uh, it explains things like religious experience. It explains um, uh, various forms of psychosis and uh, delusion. Yeah, back and to archetypes, yeah. And it explains them all without needing to refer to any sort of superstitious belief in the supernatural, in any kind of deity. I mean, that was the glory. I was literally, when I experienced uh, <laughs> amongst my psychonaut friends, we describe it as the resonator, this uh, this booming voice that occasionally interrupts the psychedelic experience. Uh, a bit like a Santa Claus type character. It feels like you never, I've never actually seen it, seen him. Or him, yeah, I guess it is a him. Uh, it, uh, and nor is it anybody else that's kind of had similar experiences, but I have heard an almost identical experience to my experience with the book being issued with the symbols, and uh, <coughs> it's actually out there in a in a uh, crop circle video. There's an old beardy guy t- saying about uh, how he'd been instructed to do what he'd done, uh, but couldn't understand what he was being asked to do at the time, which is exactly my experience. Yeah. Um, but in 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 some sort of a religious uh, paradigm, I would have taken that to have been the voice of God. Okay, I would have yes, had no yeah. other model on which to base that experience. It would have either have been I'm completely insane, or that was God. God yeah. just spoke to me. And in some sort of religious bloody paradigm, you're gonna your behaviour is going to be so. Uh, uh, Oh, um, un- unrealistic because of your ignorance of what just happened, of your projection of, you know what I mean, of some, I don't really, I, st- I still don't really understand that experience. Most, most of my experiences, I've had some kind of corroboration to be able to make some sort of sense out of them, but that was the one, that one really slapped me upside the head. Yeah. Um, still to this day, I can sort of remember it really. Well, I can remember all of them really clearly. This is the, the strange thing about experiences in non-ordinary reality is that they seem to imprint themselves on the memory in a 
much more um, three-dimensional way than ordinary memories, and they certainly don't seem to fade with age. I mean, most of these that I'm talking about are 20, 20 or more years ago that I experienced them, and yet I can still walk around in amongst them. I can still experience every microsecond yeah. of those experiences, and that's very unusual as well. I don't understand why those experiences should be so impatterned that they're more memorable than real memories and that was another thing that kind of drove me to these kind of why should my memories of not here be stronger than my memories of here yeah maybe it meant maybe it's subconsciously it meant something more to you maybe it, uh, i don't know i don't know I don't, only you can answer that mm. That's... Well, these are some of the i mean some of the the complexities that i've been fl- faced with with this but it, uh, you know i mean i i under underwent sustained uh, 15, nearly 20 years of psychiatric treatment yeah. for this stuff. I mean, I was medicated with more different types of psychiatric bloody medications than I can actually call to memory now. Yeah. Uh, many of them, things like antipsychotics, which yeah. had, to be, had to be administered with an anti, um, com- uh, anti uh, Parkinsonian's Drug to prevent the tremors that they would induce. Yeah, yeah well, I've, uh, yeah, I, could, I know, I know what you. I've been doing that road myself. Uh, if you ever heard of a drug called a lansipine? Mm, there are so many different. Oh uh, my god, what a terrible! What a, I haven't, I haven't taken a, a psychiatric medication now for probably twenty years, nearly. Oh, same as that. I think, I think what they do in the psych world. Well, well, my experience of psychiatric was that uh, they take you in, they uh, you're at your lowest ebb. They break you down and they try and rebuild you as a citizen. <laughs> if you, if you mm-hmm. get my drift to, to mm-hmm. go into normal reality, and maybe the, some of the things and some of the experiences you have have had in life are certainly far from normal. Well, I, I have to credit um, Nick Nomick with this, but uh, he gave up with the glorious line: "I used to think I was mad, and now I just know I was livid." Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, man, exactly. <laughs> Um, I, I had experiences of psychiatric. I, I remember I seen something. I, I, I talked to you about it. I seen something. I couldn't comprehend it, and uh, it, it it almost drove me uh, insane. And, at least uh, made you, or at least its its effect on your paradigm yes. led you to no other reasonable conclusion in the model that you had at the yes. time. I, yes, there was no information, and 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 the model that I had that that this does not compute. And my brain froze, and I just couldn't get it in my head. And uh, I went and I told a psychiatrist, and she said, "Oh, you're psychotic." And she gave me a load of nice drugs. Um, she gave me a lansipine, she gave me beta blockers, and she gave me a couple of other things. They actually gave me injections. I don't even, I don't even know, I don't even ask what was in them. Well, here's here's a point that, <laughs> that must be made made at this juncture is that you just said exactly the key phrase that took me probably 12 or more years of being medicated to realise you got sent to a psychologist, yeah, not a psychiatrist. Yeah. A psychologist can only medicate. They can yeah. offer no other therapy. No other therapy is and that is And that is a clear distinction that if you are going to seek help for a, a, a mental health problem and they send you to a, psychi- a psychologist expect nothing other than medication and a pat on the back yeah. and a well done, keep taking the tablets. Are yeah. they not working enough? Take a few more. Here's some more. And they actually give you they actually give you a tissue when you leave so you don't drool when you're walking. Oh, man, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I, after all that, I went to a, a small, a little woman, a little tiny little woman who was a counsellor. And she wasn't even... Mm, she, talking uh, therapy. She just, and um, within three weeks... You know, yeah. and that would have been, and that would have been a Reiki and therapy. She would have been practicing there as well. Talking therapy is essentially all talking therapies are Reiki and, uh, yeah. in their origin, and essentially that's uh, a form of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy where you literally remap the brain through the act of thinking and talking about something. Did she get you to write anything down? She did indeed. D- draw pictures, uh, write it all down, and talk to her about. It. Right, uh, so she got you to write it down and read it aloud. Yeah. Right, the reason for that is that, that speaking aloud and thinking about something that you're going to write occupied two different hemispheres. When you write something down and then read it aloud, you do something called hemisync, which yeah. is basically when the two hemispheres are separated due to their tasks, 
but are suddenly linked due to the data that's uh, coincident between them. And you find that out of uh, that sort of cognitive hemisphere, unbidden thoughts, unbidden memories, unbidden realisations just pop into your head. Yes. And that is the actual action, the direct action of, the th- of that particular therapy is to, to synchronise the two hemispheres of the brain who normally handle the two functions separately by bringing them together on a single task and a task of memory and a selective memory of you know I mean, a, a harmful past event or whatever. Yes. And that may bring something to the fore that had been a completely repressed memory or a completely repressed uh, realisation about the situation. And with this new memory or new realisation, suddenly you're... Uh, your timeline is more complete and you can begin to move on, move through the experience rather than to be stuck in a a kind of repeated few frames of a loop running round and round and round. Yes. And especially especially disturbing for you, I should imagine, seeing as it was quite a frightening experience that you had, if this this same persistence of memory that has happened to me through my non-ordinary reality experiences happened to you, then I should imagine the the memory... Mm -hmm of that event was probably clearer than any other thought in your mind. I have never been, uh, I think that it, I have never been more afraid or alone in my whole life. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into what it was, you know what it was. Mm, yeah. Than I was that, that, that I, I just couldn't get over it. I just stuck with me for ooh, four years before I could, I could even talk about it. <laughs> I mean, I suppose for me, I was, I was quite lucky that I was persistently, immersed uh in and out of this this kind of non-ordinary realm from early childhood and kind of grew up with it and i i honestly thought it was normal i thought everybody had fits yeah i i i got to 20 or 30 and it was only when i turned around to a friend and said you know what it's like when you faint and they went no no i've never fainted yeah went, what never no not ever oh Oh, right. Okay. And then I'd ask a few more. No, I've never fainted. Oh, there was that one time I kind of felt a bit woozy and had to sit down. And here's me spending my entire life kind of falling down on the floor, flapping about and thinking that that was something that everybody did when they were yeah. not well or, you know what I mean, hurt themselves. Or it was usually whenever I'd you know what I mean, had some major injury or had been so unwell that my body chemistry would go haywire and sort of go into shutdown. But Yeah. So taking lots of psychedelics is a really sensible fucking career. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a real... Uh, and well, the uh, thing was that I knew the whole time. I mean, I described, them as, I described them as heroic doses, but one on one particular occasion I decanted out a, about a half a pint of tincture yeah. off of about a pound of magic mushrooms. <laughs> and I, was, I can assure you there was no pleasure at all no. in putting that to my lips. I was petrified. Yeah, I was petrified. I knew that I had my life in my hands. Yeah, in that glass, that there was the potential to induce such a, a catastrophic temporal lobe epileptic seizure yeah, that I never gone. came back. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yet I still put it to my lips and swallowed. And I still, to this day, don't really understand who I was there standing with that thing in my hand. I certainly couldn't do it to this day. Not with, not now. I've got children. Yeah. But in those days, I would literally do anything that occurred to me. I was, okay, when, you, when you're young, Jack, you're bulletproof. I, I am actually bulletproof. This is yeah. the, the bizarre thing. Not not that I am somehow, I mean, so egotistical to think that I'm, you know, I mean, impregnable. But my life, I, I mean, this, this is, you just don't want to know the number of hideous high speed motorcycle accidents, the the completely totaled cars, the industrial accidents. The, yeah. I, I mean, I've been hung off a crane and swung through a solid bloody building wall on the edge of the gym I've, yeah. I've, I've crawled out of cars with the roof flattened onto the body shell yeah, and, yeah. and Done that should, too, have, should have been set up right in the in the steering wheel oh, and could only yeah. come to the conclusion with all of these you know, I mean, repeated events is that I'm not due to die yet and funnily enough that brings me on to another experience yeah. which is in I've had several near death experiences but one in particular was a real stark one and again sticks in the memory like no other and I I had a, uh, uh, some hideous injury, went into the light, passed out, went into the light. I think it, I think it's hard. They kind of blur into each other. I think this may have been when I passed out at the birth of my first son. 
Right. And I passed out with my head down the toilet bowl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So consequently, my unconscious body had no way of regaining a blood supply to my head. Yes. And it was purely chance that the, the birthing partner that my uh, partner at the time had taken with her to the hospital realised that I was absent, knew about my epilepsy and came in search of me. Fuck. And saved my life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about 15, 10, 15 minutes later, I was witnessing the birth of my first child, having just died in this toilet. Yeah. Um, and I think it was that particular time, but anyway... Went through the the dark tunnel, the claws, the archetypal. Again, you know what I mean? Here's where I began to understand I projected this archetype. Yeah. It went through the dark tunnel with the claws and the teeth and the gnashing and uh, see the light up the end, head towards the light, you know what I mean? Get out into the light. There you are at sort of St. Peter's Gate. It's all bright and, and slightly sparkly and a bit misty and there are sort of beings milling about in the background just slightly out of out of eyesight. And they're standing there clearly in front of me, not Jesus, not St. Peter, me. Yeah. And I was pissed off. <laughs> I was really angry. Yeah, and the yeah. person I was angry at was me. Yeah. And I, was, I kind of sensed myself almost like sort of prostrate on the floor yeah. at my own feet, being admonished by me who was not me. In my voice, with my terminology, telling me in no uncertain terms that I was some kind of idiot. What the hell was I doing here? And I had to get back to my body at once. And I remember distinctly feeling that wherever my body was wasn't a particularly nice place. And I'd actually quite like to stay here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And this kind of this ensuing argument where I got told in no uncertain terms that I wasn't supposed to be there, there and then. And yeah. piss off. Yeah. And on turning my mind away from this, I found myself back in my body with my friend lifting my head out of the toilet pan and trying to get some life back into me. Uh, well, you survived, and that's the main thing about it. Listen, Jack, uh, we're wrapping up here. Oh, Christ, we are, aren't we? Two Go minutes on. left. Listen, I want to thank you very much. I enjoyed, I enjoyed having you on. I enjoyed it hugely as well, and I just hope that this has brought some sort of uh, sensible um, uh, picture to people whose picture isn't very sensible. Yeah. There's more to this reality than meets the eye, and uh, that was the whole concept of the argument here and, and, and the debate. And uh, we not only that, we went through a lot of other stuff, and we'll just finish off on this one point that, uh, folks, at, at, there is no piece of paper, there is no man, no woman, there's no nothing written in stone of when you were sovereign or when you're not going to be sovereign. You were born that way. No one can tell you. It's your choice. You were given a choice, you came here, you got educated, you liked what you heard, you stayed, you became part of it, and you're sovereign. You don't need dates. And don't be con- conned into contracting with society Correct. and exchanging your sovereign sovereignty for some piecemeal security. Correct. Yes, well said. Folks, listen, I'm going to uh, head off, my time's up. So listen, stay safe. Stay sovereign, and uh, may your God go with you and bless you. Good night, God bless. Good night, all.